One of my new favorite feelings I get while watching a movie is when said movie is unfilmic enough and I am so detached from the notion that I am in a film's world, so unimmersed, that I suddenly become hyper aware of the fact that I'm watching actors act in front of a camera that is generally being operated by another person or a crew of people. This is usually seen as a negative trait in filmmaking, a sign something is amateurish or unconvincing, but not for me. I find it's an almost disproportionately beautiful, joyful feeling. Like, wow, a bunch of fellow human beings came together and worked their asses off for the common goal of creating a film and now I'm watching it. That's just so lovely to me, even when said film is nearly unwatchable. I've seen a lot of movies, ranging pretty much every budget and skill level you can imagine, and this feeling never diminishes for me. That excitement of accidentally getting to see beyond the film. This sensation, the evocation of overwhelming humanity, most often jumps out at me when watching movies shot on consumer-grade equipment. Which makes total sense, right? Consumer-grade equipment is historically the look of the layperson's reality. A birthday party, vacation, a day at the dog park, the aesthetic traits of whatever consumer-grade equipment was ubiquitous in your childhood and or when you first picked up a video camera of your very own, becomes intrinsically tied to your memory and ways of seeing and reflecting on your own history. The heavy grain of Super 8, tape media's purple-green light aberrations, the heavy compression algorithms of early digital, hell, the overbearing post-processing most modern smartphones applied to their images will someday send now adolescents' hearts fluttering when they grow old and weary, probably whether they realize it or not. Maybe another angle to this is that the lower a piece of art is, the more base human instinct is being captured. It's fun to joke that the most infamous bad movie directors operate the language of film as though they were space aliens, but like, the language of film is in and of itself unnatural, that we're able to communicate ideas through it is kind of miraculous in itself. If you consider artistic talent, big quotes, tantamount to one's ability to wield and conduct human emotion and experience with as much finesse as possible, well, how often are you truly in that kind of control in your day to day? Probably not very often. We're nervous animals. Our words don't come out right the first time we try. We don't always look where we're supposed to. We're all operating on a low sort of impulse most of the time. Those low elements in art can tap into something sort of primeval in us, a base instinct to recognize commonality in things that are similarly human-shaped. And I know this all sounds really lofty, but mostly, it's just fun. Above all, I think the wisdom of the internet's collective dad speaks the clearest. Sometimes, the fact that you can tell something is fake only adds to the charm because it engages the audience in the creative process of what it takes to make a movie. My dear friend Thor has talked about this in regards to video games. The more busted something is, the more you can see through the scenes. A texture being misaligned means that textures needed to be aligned to begin with, etc. And there's an argument to be made that you can learn more about filmmaking from bad films than good ones. If nobody is around to tell you what a green screen is, how else are you supposed to learn unless you see that green halo around an actor who probably got paid less than an 8 hour Carl's Jr. shift and a couple peanut butter sandwiches? One of the most consistent sources of all the above for me happens to be this hyper specific subgenre of Japanese shot on video action films I've become kind of obsessed with. Hour plus long home videos of girls wearing extremely uncanny masks and spandex cat suits play fighting in public parks and warehouses with varying levels of implied eroticism that are almost always untranslated and fundamentally question our use of the word standard within the term standard definition that the 90s and 2000s were blessed with an abundance of. The first thing I need to state is that I am not an expert on this stuff. The world of tokusatsu is simultaneously vast and very compact, and for as much as I like this stuff, I am firmly an outsider, and I'm perfectly comfortable with that. I know my place. I have neither the knowledge nor connections to make something as comprehensive as I wish I could be, but frankly, 
I want to shine a light on these titles and chat about why I like them, so today, that's all I'm gonna do. Here are some videos I've really enjoyed that deliver on the who's, how's, and why's of their subjects within this realm. You can find them among my sources for this video, link in the description. And maybe scroll down to the comments when you're done for some further insight. A lot of really smart people watch my stuff, I'm sure you'll learn down there. Oh, and I cannot have an inevitably reductive definition of the term tokusatsu on my conscience, because a definition inherently dilates or constricts based on where you're standing, but if you're completely unfamiliar with the term, maybe google it, but for the purposes of this video, just think Ultraman and Kamen Rider. And know that what I'm showing off here constitutes a subgenre of a subgenre of a subgenre. There's all sorts of great low and no budget tokusatsu out there, especially in the fan film territory, of course, but, and stop me if you've heard this one, I like girls. It's fun to watch girls do pretty much anything, so that's what I'm talking about. And what better place to start a video all about tokusatsu's weirdest heroines, blah blah blah, started it all, 1984's All About Mighty Lady. <sighs> There were tokusatsu heroines before Mighty Lady, but there were no tokusatsu heroines like Mighty Lady before Mighty Lady, whose whopping 16 meter 52-ish feet stature is immediately dwarfed in significance by her most <coughs> facet, her face. We'll talk more about this kind of heroine design later, but in the meantime, it's pretty safe to say that Lady's stiff, emotionless expression and her giant, gaping, void eyes are either the ultimate filter or exactly what drew you to her. I'm in the latter camp. From the moment I saw her, I knew she was special. I love this bitch, she's so weird. Truly alien, creeping out a silhouette in the heavy fog with that huge ass moonbeam behind her. I know the 80s were already obsessed with alien girls crashing into the lives of regular Earth boys, but that framework does go a long way to justify the fact that she ostensibly has a very quintessential anime bishoujo face. This would have been before garage kit sculptors like Bome had really cracked what sometimes is referred to as the three-dimensional contradiction, the difficulty in adapting anime proportions and stylization for the third dimension. If you look at early figures and garage kits of anime characters, Mighty Lady makes a little more sense, doesn't she? Well, her design, anyway. The direct-to-video oddity remains nigh incomprehensible as a viewer lacking the language skills to ascertain anything more than what's literally on the screen, though it's all the better for it. A common piece of independent filmmaking wisdom goes something like, the shorter your film is, the more of your budget gets to go into each minute of its runtime, and Lady's Lean 28 Minutes is solid evidence. It is all killer, no filler, not a minute goes by without something interesting happening in the frame. Just when you're starting to think, man, it's been all of about 90 seconds since someone in an elaborate costume or a miniature cityscape showed up, boom, a girl starts crucifying a Garfield plush, then hard cut to our giant alien bishoujo fighting tokusatsu Darth Vader. It is sublime. Look at her fucking work this shit. My god. And the wink! What a legend. This thing is structured like a kaleidoscopic best of compilation for a series that doesn't exist. It's amazing, and there's a reason why. It's a few different short films that were produced at different times, glued together with some interstitial sections. That's why the fidelity keeps changing. Although the junior video file in me must say, the 8mm cinematography is quite simpatico with the Betamax transfer we have access to. Ditto goes for the homemade quality of the effects, foam board buildings and drawn on laser beams. It's all very tactile, and even when not much is happening, it's nice to look at. It is a little surprising that All About Mighty Lady has never seen any modern home media releases or restorations, and this is probably the only title in the entire video you could even half convincingly say that about, because Mighty Ladies had real longevity, getting the occasional reboot through the years, as recently as 2014. 
I don't know, I guess there's always demand for giantesses. Being serious though, this is an easy recommend even without subtitles. You can find it with just a quick google search courtesy of the rare tokusatsu wordpress who this video would have been impossible without. Not just in a wouldn't have access to these sense, in a I never would have even known most of these existed sense. I'm really good at scripting videos though, so the next uh, three titles I'll be talking about weren't even discoveries I made through Rare Toku at all. Earth Defense Force Girl Eco Chun, being a Bandai produced multimedia franchise spanning a PC98 game whose pixel art you've almost certainly seen at least in passing, although I can't remember who or what would have popularized its proliferation. A manga from Space Family Carl Vinson's Asari Yoshito. A role playing game book with art by. Wait. Is this fucking Hisashi Eguchi? I can't escape this guy lately. And, among other stuff I'm sure, two live action V Cinema outings courtesy of director Minoru Kawasaki. You know, the man who brought you such titles as Crab Goalkeeper, Executive Koala, Naked Female President Manyuki, and Nipple Drill Counterattack Attack of the Nipple Drill. <gasps> Definitely deserves an in-depth video retrospective or article by someone, but mostly I just need you to see this. Ah, I can't. And this. If you're somehow unimpressed, just know that the second one has this glorious sequence where it just gives up on being a movie and starts fucking inundating you with a bunch of random shit that nobody asked for but will surely delight. The Minoru Kawasaki movie I most want to see, for the record, is of course Miracle Bunny, which you bet your ass would be represented in this video regardless of how much it fit the theme, because fucking look at it. Tragically though, from what I can tell nobody has put a copy of it online and presumably everyone selling a copy is aware. As if some bizarre cosmic consolation prize though, there's a stealth connection between Miracle Bunny and All About Mighty Lady that warrants my bringing it up at all, and it happens to be legitimately one of my favorite pieces of ephemera ever. <laughs> Miracle Bunny's lead actress was also the lead in a little film from 1988 directed by Mighty Ladies Ichiro Omomo. That's the connection. It's probably pure coincidence, although I'm sure there was a whole network of behind the camera mutual respecters in the 80s effects film world. When I first stumbled into Star Virgin following a game of film credit telephone though, Lady hadn't even been archived by Rare Toku, so I just wrongly assumed Star Virgin was the only thing this guy ever did. I guess I just never thought to google him? Even after I watched Mighty Lady for the first time, I totally missed the connection. Okay, okay, the elephant in the room is obviously the name Star Virgin. I know, Hazel, are you talking about porn in a YouTube video again? And like, there are times when a film lays it on a little too thick that it's capable of anything, right? It's like being at a house show and chatting with someone you barely know and they suddenly stop and go, Hey man, just so you know, I have a gun with me. It's like nothing is realistically going to happen. And in this dude's mind, this is probably just a common courtesy, but it's like, Jesus Christ, okay. That's the kind of energy that Star Virgin hinges on. You don't open your film with your heroine tied to a cross as a giant frog for any other reason than to communicate to an audience just exactly what they're in for, right? And I'm fine with that. The night I watched Star Virgin, I also watched two of the guinea pig films, for God's sake. I went into this thing knowing the premise was girl has superpowers but can only use them when her status as a virgin is put at immediate risk. The bikini armor is right on the cover, but somehow it's actually shockingly chaste, it's just strangely sweet endlessly charming and, more importantly, a fucking blast. Like Mighty Lady, it's not content to stay in the same place for more than a few minutes, but unlike Mighty Lady, this is clearly a legit ass production. Jungle, hyperspace, bubble bath, seaside town, dentist office, tank chase, random white guy, transformation, explosion, actual Looney Tunes shit, chillin' with her dweeby little boyfriend at sunset. 
This is the first 15 minutes, for fuck's sake. This is not even to mention the floating island, or robot samurai, or the evil dung beetle, or the mecha statue of liberty. This was a year before Penis Busters 2, by the way. Like, holy shit. And because Kenji Kawai really is like, yeah, what's good, I'll score anything, the OST is firing on all cylinders at all times. God, it's almost exhausting, but that's exactly what something like this should be. Oh, also, there's a tie-in MSX game. I only found out about that while doing research for this video. In hindsight, it's laughable. I was a bit worried going into a rewatch that because this was the first of its kind that ever made its way to me, my fondness for it might be overblown. I've basically been riding the high of finishing Star Virgin and going, oh my god, wait, no, don't tell me there's nothing else like this ever since, even well after I learned that wasn't the case. I was still so wet behind the ears that all I knew to compare it to were the duology of 90s unofficial live-action Dragon Ball movies, South Korea's Dragon Ball Fight Son Goku Win Son Goku, and Taiwan's Dragon Ball The Magic Begins. Amazing films, by the way. Get a group of friends together for a double feature sometime. Trust me, you won't be disappointed. Needless to say, I still think Star Virgin is an unimpeachable banger, even after I've discovered more and more of these. You may ask, though, if there are so many, where do these come from? What I said about not wanting to misdefine tokusatsu also goes for the term V-cinema, the distribution and production method many of these hero and tokusatsu films fall into. If you ignore the fact that V-cinema is explicitly a Toei trademark, and these should probably just be referred to as original videos, if I didn't speak a language in which those two words didn't have about a thousand potential definitions, and if you ignore the fact that the definition is still loose enough either way that it's debatable how many of these actually count as V-cinema to begin with. Look, all you need is OVA but live action. In its simplest terms, movies, many of which are sub-feature length, produced for a home video market or that were otherwise built to flourish more on home video than anywhere else. Of course, that inherently carries with it a simultaneously vast and very compact set of signifiers, tropes, and machinations. That's why we even need a term. For example, V-Cinema is of particular relevance to horror fans. This is what I associated the term with for years. Horror has historically been a reliable genre for making decent returns on modest budgets, so V-Cinema swiftly became home to endless amounts of weirdo horror. When you're not selling on IP strength, you're selling on niches. So yeah, mostly horror movies and sex films. And as a result, a lot of V-Cinema special effects films, including tokusatsu, have to deliver on the viewer's expectations that they're either going to see cool creatures and gore, or with a title that screams, oh god, oh shit, I just heard the front door unlocked, that means mom and dad are back, oh christ, where did I put the fucking Wii remote? I need to close the opera browser! Comes Big Boob Buster. And I'm sorry, but the contents of this film could be 90 minutes of an old man eating graham crackers and I'd still be bringing it up based on the name alone. Thankfully it's not, although what it is, is hardly better for my purposes. I can barely show you anything, much less the funny stuff, so just know that in the opening sequence they do the Spongebob pushing through the wall in 3D thing, but with the operative word in the film's namesake, if you get what I mean. It's sleazy, like a sleazier Wong Jing comedy, and if you're not down to laugh with or at it, you're gonna want to look elsewhere. Would you believe I've consistently heard the sequel is the better film? If mid-90s women's pro wrestling stars dressing up in Keita Amemiya's hand-me-downs and wandering around empty landscapes is more your speed, consider the works of Hitoshi Matsuyama, specifically his Monster Commando trilogy. I have reason to suspect Matsuyama has big cred in this space. He's got credits on both Pervoid, Aerogro, Classic Guzo, and one of my favorite Oshi joints, but the Amemiya the comparison is too easy not to make, and plus, that's not a bad thing. Being a Kroger brand Keta Amemia is like being a Kroger brand bottle of club soda. It's gonna pair well with alcohol no matter what. 
Good luck keeping these films in line, though. I watched these last week and I'm already like, fuck, which one is M and which one is H and which one is Y? Well, why don't we establish some mnemonics that'll help you decide which is for you? Why is for, yeah, this one's probably my favorite. And the whole thing is bathed in these oppressive, hazy greens I find appealing. M is for, man, this is shot way too dark to see anything, but that alien woman creature thing is grade A creepypasta type shit. Points for that. And H is for hot, and dry, like the desert, because that's where this thing takes place. A lot of desert. Ditto goes from Matsuyama's later feature, Space Hunter Miki, which more resembles Jerry than it does Tokusatsu, which might be your thing, although I'm just gonna gently whisper in your ear, don't be weird, it's okay if you commit the ultimate moviegoer's sin and watch some of these at two times speed. It's okay, you've already got cred for watching unsubtitled foreign films. It's gonna be okay. Nobody has to know. While Not For Kids Tokusatsu was always aimed primarily at the otaku market, as the subcultural signifiers around otaku constricted in specificity, and as Heisei economic desperation turned the demographic into more of a prospective cash cow, you start to see titles get more and more exacting in calling out who exactly they're for. See, for example, 1996's Cosplay Warrior Cutie Night, which might as well be running down a checklist. Bikini armor, bunny girls, nurses, Third Reich bondage villains, Gamera, Fawcett, man. Flash forward 12 years, otaku culture constricts further and you get Akibalian, battle maids of Akihabara. Oh my fucking god, wait, I forgot to watch this. Hold on, I gotta make a quick trip. To Scarecrow Video, the largest video rental store in at least the United States and the largest publicly accessible home video archive in the world, localized entirely in Seattle, Washington, where I currently live. I'm seriously so lucky to have something like this in my figurative backyard. It's come in clutch for me more times than I can even count when I need obscure, trapped on physical media films and anime in a pinch. Every time I'm in Scarecrow, something new always catches my eye, and a big part of that comes down to their eye for curation. Last time I was in, they had a bunch of summer camp horror movies on display, which, as a recent evangelist for the Sleepaway Camp sequels, not that one, made me happy to see. And when Albert Pune died late last year, they dedicated a shelf to him, which was sweet. And hey, what's this little number right here? Scarecrow is one of my favorite places in the city. They've been nonprofit for almost a decade, and they're entirely supported by donations and by their customers. Which is why, when I was hit up by one of their alumni to create a spotlight of my very own for their anime section, I jumped at the opportunity. Now, for the sake of transparency, I've had a lot of requests for sponsorships or collaborations from brands and businesses in my time as a career video woman, and I've deleted every single one, usually without even opening them, so I hope it speaks to how much I value Scarecrow that I spent a weekend coming up with the theme, moseying over to Scarecrow, picking up a bunch of titles that looked interesting or that I knew would fit the theme, watching them, writing little blurbs about each title and putting together a YouTube thumbnail style banner image, completely for fun. No money exchanged hands here, unless you count the light rail fee, and obviously I don't consider this a sponsorship. I want people to see it in person when it goes up, so I don't want to say anything here, but if you like that video I did just talking about a bunch of OVAs, my anime spotlight is like a WarioWare micro game version of that, just, you know, with fewer mistakes about the history of tentacle porn. You'll see my spotlight pop up sometime in late August of this year. Also, for anyone in the city, if you feel strongly about media preservation, Scarecrow's always looking for volunteers, which is probably a great way to meet new and like-minded people, and will give you some fun kickbacks in the long term. They didn't ask me to say that, by the way. I mentioned it because I actually almost started volunteering for them at the start of this year before getting busy with a whole bunch of other shit. 
Okay, hi, hello, yeah, Akibalian is exactly what you'd expect. A manga artist, a maid, and a graffiti idol, as the profoundly short-skirted Akibalian fight kaiju disguised as all sorts of normal human creeps. This is what I see in my head every time one of you motherfuckers starts talking about girl smell. Keep that in mind. While living and working in the heart of Tokyo's nerd district. It's made up of five 40-ish minute episodes, and honestly, the best part for me anyway is the guerrilla-style cinematography of circa 2008 Akihabara. As I've talked about, Akihabara has changed a lot since the aughts, and as with any dense metropolitan area where businesses are constantly rotating in and out, pretty much anything filmed on location there doubles as an invaluable time capsule. Moreover, I would be shocked if they had a permit to film in most of these alleyways, and that's the way it should be done, damn it! Get in, get your shots before the cops show up, get the fuck out, that's filmmaking! Oh, and their costumes look great too. I love any outfit that incorporates components that actually light up. But okay, I'm like a dog straining and gnawing at my fucking leash right now, I gotta talk about digital video. This was the whole reason I wanted to make this video, because it was a good excuse to watch a bunch of early digital filmmaking. It's like an addiction, I can't get enough. A lot of it comes down to what I talked about in this video's intro, but just as much goes to the visual component. It can be so ugly and desaturated and cold, almost the opposite of how VHS is remembered. It's like it confirms every negative preconception about the very fact it is digital video. The overactive auto white balance, the insane optical and digital zooms, the texture interlacing adds to the image. It's fucking textbook. Brian Eno would be rolling his eyes right now, but this is who I am. We are now strictly in the shot on video zone. Technically we have been the, the whole time. I've been shooting this on an old prosumer Sony camera I got an insane deal on recently, but everything I'm talking about today from this point on was shot on standard definition, often consumer grade video cameras. Yes, the real video starts here, but first, some context. You definitely don't need me to tell you that the increasing affordability of camcorders through the late 90s and early aughts sparked an independent filmmaking revolution because the biggest new movie in the fucking world as of my writing this in the summer of 2023 was directed and co-written by a woman whose career was functionally launched by said independent filmmaking revolution in a film shot on this very camera I'm using today by pure coincidence. So let me hone in on something a little more granular. Common Rider made the jump to digital pretty much as soon as there existed equipment suitable for utilizing variable frame rates at the series' budget level. Since, since its inception in the 70s, Common Rider has been shot at two different speeds, 24 frames per second, the film standard for everything but the action, which was shot at 22 frames per second, and then run at 24 frames per second, if I'm understanding the reading I've done correctly. Sources are in the description, correct me if I'm wrong. So around 2003, as an experiment, they shot the Fies movie on a Panasonic AJHDC27F, you know, the Borat camera, which could shoot at a whopping 720 lines of vertical resolution at a number of frame rates. Since 2005's HBQ, digital was pretty much how everything else was shot. Modern Kamen Rider is shot on 4K Vericams, but Shin Kamen Rider is like 40% consumer grade cameras with all sorts of built in compression algorithms that you can see the results of in the final product, and I think that's fucking awesome. All of this is just to say that the quirks of early digital video have retroactively become kind of intrinsic to the look of tokusatsu from a modern purview. So there's something that just feels cosmically 
tactilely correct about the glut of sexy girl ninja or space warrior or cyber police officer fight girl v cinema and its intersection with the specific niche of common writer fan films that sell themselves on having one or two former cast and crew on board that erupted onto store shelves around the same time as common writers jumped to digital. There are seriously so many of these though. Search v cinema on Surigaya if you don't believe me. You're gonna see a lot of girls in spandex. And they're not really my speed, in part because of the like genuinely kind of perverse voyeuristic feeling some of the more adult ones have. Like, I don't know, I'm not stupid. I'm aware eroticism plays a part in everything I'm talking about today. If this were a moral judgment, first and foremost, it'd be fairly incoherent on my part. Nah, frankly, it's just a matter of taste. I'm just not into joylessly watching women joylessly squirm around as guys in monster costumes poke and prod at and undress them. Maybe if I was, I'd be more into Cyber Sentai Justy One, whose deeply uncanny and uncinematic feel is almost enough for me to look past the fact that it's pretty much unwatchable and adult enough to be untalkaboutable on YouTube. There is stuff to like here, I mean, primarily that it just doesn't feel very much like a movie, or maybe too much like a movie, and it's a little scary as a result. I think it all comes down to the loose editing. Every time there's a cut, it's like you can see the moment the actor decides to switch into acting mode, and then when it's about to cut again, it hangs just a second too long. You can almost kind of see the actress like, uh, are we cutting yet? Like, should I, should I break? Like, what's good here? I love that kind of editing, and thankfully, well, for me, I know it was a huge burden on anyone making movies without a computer, shot on video films are rife with it. Films like 2000's Love Warrior Pantheon 2000, whose intro sequence does my single biggest self-directed YouTube video pet peeve, where a single stray frame of something else slips into a sequence where it isn't intended right at the point of a cut. For my workflow, it happens because I talk about anime and there are a lot of cuts in anime and sometimes you need every single frame of a scene to fit into the time it takes to say whatever you're saying about it. And then a stray frame of the next shot slips in there at the very end. It's a damn shame this thing crosses the threshold into being too perverse for its own good because I really wanted to love this and maybe I still do because I feel like this might be a Y2K story Nostradamus. Are you there? It did explain the protagonist's cross necklace a little. The titular love warrior looks great. I love her winged eyeliner and, of course, all of her glowing gems. In the few fight scenes she gets, she kicks ass. Look at her go with that sword. Doesn't even flinch when the pyrotechnics start going off either. Makes it all the sadder there's less of her than there are long, drawn out roping sequences, and that despite the profound tonal mismatch those two things already make for, they don't even get to be mutually exclusive. So. Next. Luckily, there was a trend, as I understand, where some of these adult works would receive abridged recuts that removed a lot of the offending content. I think these were done primarily for compilation DVDs, which makes sense. It's a total win-win as far as I'm concerned. Shorter runtime and less I have to edit around, which gives me more leeway to talk about Yukihime, of which there's a good amount to say. From the very first shot, in fact, the kind of grainy, contextless esoterica you'd see in a video called some shit like 12 disturbing unexplained deep web videos. This thing is loaded to the brim with deliciously cheap production value. You get the feeling they just sort of had to commit to whatever their first attempts were for the costuming. One of the masks is permanently agape, and one of the others is, I swear, crooked. Like, they're all worn kind of crooked, but I'm damn near sure this one was just constructed this way, and like, you can kind of tell the cameraman is trying as hard as possible to film around it. 
Oh, and this fantastic breakaway door too. Ah, oh, it is so good. This PlayStation-ass CGI exterior gives way to the most soundstage-ass interior. She comes out from behind a curtain, and ironically, it probably would look passable if the filmmaking wasn't active and playful enough to get these low-angle shots where you can see the ceiling as clear as day. Other V-Cinema action flicks wouldn't dare commit to not one, but two in-the-water fight scenes. What a nightmare these must have been to film, but they honestly nail it. The choreography is solid the whole way through. They even nail a show a common Rider flip. Although the cutting down a tree with a single sword strike effect was done much better in Star Virgin. Oh, and it can be really pretty, though my bias toward mini-DV might be guiding my hand here a bit. This final shot of the protagonist holding a sparkler is, like, so beautiful to me. The deep blues contrasting against the blown-out light of the sparks and their resulting lens flares. Like, wow. And oh man, mini-DV lens flares. Koakuma, My Sweet Devil Part 2, No Clue What's Up With Part 1, opens on a fantastic one. This right here is what I love so much about the sensors or whatever they put into these old camcorders. The sky is so overexposed, it's all one big mass of the exact same shock white. I believe this was made by the same crew who put together Yukihime, but I'm not certain. There's a similar eye for location on display, if nothing else. Between this and the earlier Akibalian in particular, there's a real case to be made that low-budget tokusatsu doubles as a strong swatch of regional filmmaking. This nighttime footage of Yokohama is such a treat, as is this super striking intermodal container storage yard. There's a fantastic shooting the rodeo sequence here, where in the middle of the film, our heroine tears it up at the batting cages. Koakuma comes highly recommended. For just a half hour of your time, you get all that, plus a fantastic cat. Fruit Ninja in real life, they set a good amount of shit on fire, and it has one of the most baffling attempts at maintaining shot continuity I think I've ever seen. Check this out. So the big confrontation at the end of this thing takes place outdoors, in broad daylight, right? It plays out like normal at first, and then suddenly we cut to this CG stormy sky, which then cuts back to the fight scene, except it's suddenly way darker. Like not, oh, it's later in the day dark. It's like they took the brightness lighter in whatever they edited this in and turned it down. At first I was like, okay, this is either an error or because we're watching an edited cut here, it was done to mitigate some strobing effects that are coming up. You know, like they did with Pokemon. Good taste, by the way. Two of my favorite Gen 2 mons. But then, with an ever so slight change in location, all is revealed. It was overcast when they shot this part of the climax. All that to account for a change of weather. And the beauty is, I would not have even noticed that it had gotten overcast if it weren't for said darkening, because the camera's auto white balance already makes these two sequences look basically identical. It's brilliant. Why couldn't they just wait until the plane passed to do the take? The strength of the heroine costume in Koakuma cannot go unstated, too. I think it splits the difference on the Mighty Lady Uncanny Valley problem really well by pushing it so far into the alien, almost amphibian territory, and I just adore how ornate it is, her jewelry swaying with every motion. I also like this frog guy, actual amphibian alert! All that was fun, but I've been holding out long enough. It's time to get to the big guns. I'm gonna be honest, I lied earlier. The real video actually starts here. It's time for me to introduce you to the one, the only, AU Club. Maybe one of the most prolific filmmaking collectives in this micro-genre, with a filmography in the double digits, AU Club came together in the name of one shared trait, an indisputable and unwavering passion for gynoids. 
You might think, oh come on, most of these other films showcase the same love of the robotic female and or the female robotic. What's special here? Or even, who the hell doesn't? But you just don't get it. I'm not even sure I get it, and that's why I love it. I've said before that I'm just not really into big robot stuff, but I need to make a distinction clear here. My brain was big time baby blended by watching stray episodes of Metabots whenever I could on cable television, and later getting way, way into the Mega Man Battle Network games. I love a good humanoid robot. As a result, AU Club's costuming from first blush drilled down directly into what's left of the primordial soft spot in my skull so hard the resulting head trauma made me think that making this video would be a good idea. Something I cherish about being into movies is when you sit down with one almost on a whim that catches your eye and then realize you've stumbled into an entire filmmaking movement or genre you've never heard of that you then get to become acquainted with. And before long, you're familiar enough with it that your entire perspective beforehand seems so much smaller in retrospect. The nature of my work is such that I get to go through a few of these a year, and one of this year's all started with AU Club's first film, or at least the first that's readily available as of my writing, 1998's Cyber Lady Suzuka. I had already seen Star Virgin and Mighty Lady, but this was the one that made me go, oh fuck, okay, so this is like a thing. The very first thing you see when starting Cyber Lady Suzuka is one of those old digital title makers in action. You used to plug him into a VCR via composite cables and you could use it to live overlay text onto a tape. That totally unaliased, dull colored look gotta be one of those things. What follows is an intro sequence full of a bunch of cute art of our titular heroine that really sells Suzuka's charms, of which I feel like there are a lot of. The bold segmented colors, her space agey dress, the little metal components at her joints, what a fashionable gal. And uh, you can tell she was the singular priority. Cyber Lady Suzuka is the definition of what can most charitably be called efficient filmmaking in the H.G. Lewis sense. If it isn't what's getting asses in seats, don't spend anything more than absolutely necessary on it. No gimbals, no dollies, most of the camera work is handheld, they shoot this shit under bridges and in garages and public parks when nobody is watching, all the interiors look just like someone's house or apartment, the robotics are made up of a computer keyboard, a circuit board, and an arcade stick, and a Sailor Moon clock, I guess? And Hey, quick aside, I know this video doesn't touch on either the tokusatsu that inspired Sailor Moon, nor the Sailor Moon toku series itself. Sorry, I know they exist. All the other production design, excluding Suzuka, has this total handmade feel. Like, one of these bad guys is just a fucking Party City gorilla costume. It looks like suburban Sasquatch. So good. I love to use my imagination. However, this one doesn't come recommended. For as charmed as I am by the herky-jerky camera work and clumsy choreography, I can admit it's an hour of nothing, even if it ends in a pretty great post credit scene at a video rental joint where Suzuka judges a guy for renting porn tapes. I'm going chronologically through AU Club's work where I most certainly wasn't before because Lilac, Dream of Shudder, released three years after Suzuka is an immediate improvement. I mean, check it out, a real title card. I actually wouldn't say the film benefits from a higher budget because I don't really think it has one and because it's actually much more restrained in scope. Nah, it's just better made across the board. and this will be a trend. The filmmaking is much more dynamic. There are just more shots in this thing. Some real wide masters and all the nighttime cinematography looks great. 
The exteriors are crushed, the stark beams of light illuminate only what's right in front of them, and the interiors are all bathed in a deep blue light. What money they don't spend on extra suits and locations, they must have spent on pyrotechnics! Fuck yes! But honestly, I'm even more into the suburban setting. The shot of Lilac and her apartment is just so wonderfully incongruent after all. You get so used to seeing heroines out and about in their costume forms that a woman dressed like this in what is probably her own apartment just looks fucking insane. Man, she totally just looks like Lena Inverse. M minus the, uh, eyes. I've already talked about it in fits and starts up to this point, but I do think it warrants interrogation. Pretty much every friend I've shown the AU Club girls to have said they're creepy. The hard plastic features, the lifeless eyes and blank expression, I totally get where they're coming from, and I suspect a lot of people watching will feel the same, but I don't know, I think they're oddly compelling. That could just be the same thing, but I don't know. I love Vocaloid and the PlayStation 3 and the wax grapes they sell at craft stores. For as obsessed as I am with naturalism, I think my inclinations can really trend toward the glaringly artificial, and what is this video about if not the reality that there can be a very thin line between the natural and the artificial? That's what you're supposed to do, right? Tell the audience what the thesis is? Anyway, Multiplicity of Meaning states it's either kind of sweet and powerful or extremely perverted that our protagonist's childhood object of comfort is what grants her the strength she needs to turn into a sexy spandexed anime girl, and likewise, depending on who you are, Lilac, Dream of Shudder, is either mercifully or tragically short. I'm going with the latter. This is my favorite, I think. I even bought the sequel blue version. It won't get here until after this video is out, but I'll wrap it the best I can and get it put up on the internet archive or on the second channel or something like that. None of these commuters had any idea they played a small part in a bizarre little production called Everoid Seria from 2002. Isn't that magical? I mean, okay, I've joked a lot about everything being shot without permits, but that's definitely a little naive to assume. There's no way they just fired off these pyrotechnics in the middle of fuck all anywhere. Much like any controlled explosion, fleeting moments of excitement among a sea of nothing is the name of the game with this one. Some nice shots, some cool effects, check out the bottom of the frame. Saria hip checks the journalist character at one point, very cute. Some toilet paper mommy. All weaved sparsely through a dull, if inoffensive, hole. What makes Everoid Saria a fun watch for me though was its accompanying behind the scenes doc. I think these were made alongside most AU Club releases, but again, I can only talk about what I have access to. Okay, see, what do I know? They had table reads. This is totally a legit production. Although they still shot all the blue screen sequences in someone's house, and according to the documentary, if I understand, someone on crew passed out from heat stroke during one of the film's outdoor shoots. So who knows what the fuck was happening there? And the documentary camera really loves to ogle this girl when the main camera isn't running. Uh, hey, wait a minute. In the middle of shooting here, some fucking guy on a horse gallivants by. So now I really am questioning if they had permission to film here. I guess that's a different thing from being allowed to close it off, but they're fucking with explosives and shit. You don't want to risk a horse busting in and detonating anything by horse mistake. Hello, Editing Room Hazel here at a modest 8pm, and through this whole edit I kept thinking, God, the Saria costumes remind me so much of something I can't place. Maybe Sonic's Chaos or Cosmo? No, I've finally placed it. It's Hal in the speedwalking episode of Malcolm in the Middle. Anyway. While at present I don't think I have access to Cyber Lady Suzuka's sequel, we do have Ausencia Memoria, which is the sequel to Everoid Seria. I think this is the first film of theirs we have above VHS quality, and getting to see things a little clearer, it can look sublime. 
They push the wide shots even further here. AU Club really knows how to shoot nighttime at this point, and latexy jackets. Check out this smart little moment of composition and editing where Asensia, I'm guessing is her name, passes through a door the shot is framed through and runs past the camera we hold, then quick fade to her leaving another door. Dead simple, but it's a lot to ask for for these kinds of films. And how about this shot with the foreground plant framing this character? They even push the VFX to the max here. But again, this is efficient filmmaking. They still throw each other into a bunch of empty Asahi boxes, and uh, come on, cl clean your lens, guys. <laughs> I'm proud to announce that the most amazing non sequitur moment in a hero and tokusatsu film since All About Mighty Lady's Garfield Crucifixion, undoubtedly until further notice, is awarded to Asensia Memoria for its unreal crossfade centric emotional saxophone scene. If AU Club aren't the pinnacle of the DIY tokusatsu gynoid, they're the pinnacle of incredible names. In a just world, Battle Holography Wind would be the kind of million dollar title that launches careers, but here it is in this video, so obviously, tragically, didn't happen. I get it though, this one is out there even by my standards. Dead simple premise though, it's literally just Tetsujin 28 Go right down to a toy cameo. Like check this kid with his motherfucking Vio laptop, insane child swag steering his robot girl protector. They play with that dynamic in a cute way where she fights in a lot of kid logic-y ways, skipping rope with the baddies, playing recorder so bad it hurts, she makes a guy fall and hit his nuts, good stuff. Still, it's slight enough, less than half an hour, and with essentially one location, it doesn't make too much of an impression. Where the rare toku uploads stop is where my access to AU Club's filmography too ends. A lot of their work is long out of print and I believe was mostly produced for doujin events like Wonderfest, and as a result doesn't turn up online super often. I started to conceptualize this video all the way back in January of this year, get ready to hear me say that for the next like six videos, and I kept infrequent tabs on Surugaya and Yahoo Japan auctions to see if any other AU Club releases popped up and not really anything that hasn't already been put online, save for the one I grabbed, although I think there are a few other places you can scoop these that for me constitute uncharted waters I am not interested in entering. You'll see. So if you like this stuff, keep an eye out on Japanese secondhand sites. For whatever reason, Tsurigaya is more thorough than perhaps any other space online in documenting doujin works, perhaps more thorough than the Library of Congress, simply by the fact that they don't clear out their pages for anything that's ever been sold there even when it's been sold out for decades. After the websites of doujin circles are long gone, you'll still find info on their works on Surigaya. It's certainly nowhere near complete, but we can do a quick survey on some of AU Club's other releases this way. I'm loving the huge Toru Nakayama sensibilities on Teruro Kyo. Nakayama was the character designer for the Mega Man Zero and ZX games. Meanwhile, Oyako Robo is the one that harkens back strongest to the Battle Network comparison I made earlier. It's like right there with the interdictory circle motif. Yep, had to look that one up. But no, nah, the work I most want to see turn up is Dream Monster Chow. Okay, I did not make this point clear enough in the script. Of all of the images that I have consumed for this video, every single frame of every single one of these, the image that I am most obsessed with is this one of Dream Hunter Chow. I think it's all about that sink. There's something about that sink, the fact that they clearly didn't even tidy the place up before this picture was taken, although I have a hunch it's technically been here the whole time. Given this tweet I found alluding to watching it on a certain video site, which I suspect is the Akiba Broadband Vision site, where a few AU Club videos seem to still be hosted behind a paywall. 
Uh, ABV is a paywalled fetish video site, though, and like, look, of course this doesn't surprise me. These things don't need to have adult content to be implicitly fetishistic. Why else do YouTube videos of people inducing sneezes get as many views as they do? And of course I use the term fetishistic neutrally here. The word means a very broad spectrum of things, often at the same time. I certainly don't mean to overblow that quality in these works, much less ascribe anything to their creators, and I do believe that at the end of the day, the goal of these films is to entertain. And either way, it's no different from the chicken and egg question people have with furries, and it doesn't gotta be our business. I'm really sorry, I didn't think I'd wind up here when I started this video out. I decided to do some exploring around a very unfamiliar part of the internet I won't show for a series of obvious reasons. At first, just to make sure my terminology was correct, I believe you would call this a when English speakers think kigurumi, we tend to specifically think these adult onesies someone is always wearing every time you step into a round one. The word literally just means character costume, hence why this and this are all kigurumi. Although the latter is definitely where the so-called kigurumists trend toward. In the time it took me to hopefully ensure I wasn't going to call it the wrong thing, something funny kept happening to me. I kept finding people in this community talking about and sharing contents from AU Club's body of work. This is something I see in my research a lot. My Arisa Good Luck video hinged on it, where, frustratingly, some of the most reliable resources on these vintage doujin works are from old guard fans and colleagues casually and contextlessly talking about them and their works. I'm used to the presence of adult content being a guarantee for archival. We've all watched a theatrical film or two on an adult website out of necessity. And yet, what surprises me is that the only people who are doing this with AU Club are fetishists, not even tokusatsu fans or historians. Listen, I'm running really low on stamina here, so I'm gonna cut to the chase. Literally as I had written as far into the script as I am narrating right now, I fucking find, through the retweets of one of these accounts, a link to a booth site of one Akase planning. And what do I see here but a bunch of AU Club stuff, and a link to their YouTube channel where a bunch of other AU Club videos reside. Like, just a bunch of the full videos, just chilling out there, in the open, that I missed at every point but right now. Okay, well, if they're here, I'm gonna talk about them, but first, fucking how? I'm not positive, but my guess is that it's the result of Akase Planning's Yoshihiro Akase simply exchanging a mutual favor for some old scene buddies. I'll host some of your old out of print videos and we can both make some money, that sort of thing. Akase's been in the business for a long time. In 1995, he was working for a local Yokohama TV network on their program Amateur Visual Shock G. During production, talk of an image character for the show began, leading to the birth of Jiko-chan, who is, according to Akase, Japan's first headgear idol. Those are just his words, though. I have no reason to doubt him, but like, you never know. I've got no other sources. We're talking about a nearly 30-year-old local TV station. Of course the only person talking about it is one of the guys whose fingerprints are all over it. Akase, hungry to prove himself in a world where independent distribution simply wasn't as viable, jumped at the opportunity to produce a series of Jiko shorts for the station, even if he had to produce one a month. He talks about slaving over these episodes, usually right down to the wire, editing in public facilities until close, and driving eight hours just to deliver the completed product to the station every month. Five minutes of completed film a month might not sound like much now, but that's only because technological advancements have made inconceivable the reality that even in the 90s, every step of filmmaking took significantly longer than it can now. And here I am, complaining about how slow progress on this video has been. So what does a monthly TV spot made by the tiniest team imaginable look like? As any good independent production does, they get sort of meta with it, in that they set the shorts within the show's own production, so all the TV equipment doubles as set design. The corners cut are hardly visible though. Weirdly, it reminds me a lot of the pilots for Always Sunny with its handheld but still sitcom-esque camera work. 
always keeping subjects clear and in frame, takes her on the long side, but in a comfortable way. I get a strangely nostalgic feeling from it. Maybe because it's so regional, where even though it's so specific, it wraps back around and makes you feel warm about the places you've lived. I think it helps that this is taking primary influence from the Toei Fushigi comedy series. Rather than action tokusatsu like every single other subject in this video, it allows Jiko to be fully personality forward, to the point where without subtitles I felt like I understood her unique relationship to each other character. If there was one of these for every spandex girl fight movie, I'd be a happy woman. I've totally been left wanting more, and I guess there is a little more that can be purchased on Akase Planning's booth page, but I'm not really in the mood to finagle setting up a booth account, so what I have here is just gotta be enough for today. Remember when I said this video would be deliberately limited in scope? Jiko is technically still around nowadays, in some form, though Akase Planning's more focused on their mascot, Little Dokia-chan, so cute, as well as some original works that are being made and released, like, now. This is just crazy to me, still. I've been doing this a while now, and I'm so used to only finding ghosts of these works everywhere I go, remnants, so seeing shit this contemporary, like last 12 months contemporary, is stunlocking me a little. Okay, okay, AU Club Filmography Retrospective Part 2 Engage. Jesus fucking Christ. Not going chronological here, just gonna write about him as I watch him. Let's start with Support Roid Eureka, shall we? It's actually pretty wild. Perhaps the most literal wish fulfillment here, Eureka's a combination servant, lover, combat robot with the kind of irrefutable heart only someone who really truly believes in the sanctity and beauty of the relationship between man and robot girl could infuse into a work. The climax sees the bad guy hypnotizing the human man into fighting Eureka and the only thing that can bring the real him back to life is their love. Aww. The emotional peak for me, though, was the unbridled elation I experienced when he's doing some work on Eureka and he's reviewing her memories through what is clearly a camcorder LCD display that is still attached to the rest of the camcorder, just barely out of frame. Oh man, last one. Time on the AU Club crossover film. It is just wonderful. It'll sound funny, but I'm happy to see these girls again. I actually full stop laughed out loud when I saw the fucking tournament bracket pop up. Like, yeah, fuck it. That's how you do a crossover. No elaborate framework, no attempting to cram a dozen characters into one story. Just give them what they want. Part of me wants to say if you watch one AU Club film, just check this one out since it's got the least downtime, but I do like the downtime, and I wouldn't call choreography one of AU Club's strengths, and the red lilac girl gets eliminated in the first round, so I don't know. The pure self-love and self-indulgence on display is infectious. Huge, smashing beloved action figures together stuff. And would you believe, this still isn't everything AU Club, and that I do not just mean their filmography? I'm convinced the rabbit hole is never-ending. See, AU Club had a DeviantArt page that hosts a ton of photography of all their suit designs. The gallery is great to look through. In the description, though, are two choice links. The first one leads to their old website, partially accessible via the Wayback Machine, and I wasn't super thorough, but some of the information in there did inform earlier parts of this video about AU Club. They mentioned they had to freeze their message board because there were too many gaijin flooding it. If you were one of those gaijin on the AU Club forum in the 2000s, please, please tell me about your experiences and how you even got there. It's that second link, though, that led me to the biggest and most insane discovery of the whole video, and the fact that there have been multiple already blows my mind. It was upon clicking this link and acclimating to the information that was directly in front of me that I had a revelation. One of AU Club's members, as the aughts drew to a close, went on to found an all-robot girl cover band. I introduce you to Neo Robotics. I am beside myself over this. I mean, 
is there even anything to say when anything that could be said is screaming right in my face already? I love this so much. Can you imagine being in Japan in 2010 and just fucking stumbling into a live house because hey, it's something to do, and seeing one of several robot girls fucking it up to Luca Luca Night Fever? I don't have many regrets in life, none that elevate past the ultimately trivial, but I've got a new one. And it's not being in a tiny little live house in Japan in 2010 to see a band of robot girls thrashing out a cover of God Knows. I gotta be honest, I actually can't tell how they pulled this off. There's no way the vocals weren't pre-recorded, and for the record, yes, these are real singers, as in not voice synthesis. The reason I assume it's gotta be pre-recorded is because, well, where would the sound be coming from? They'd be muffled underneath that mask. But the audio sounds like how someone singing into a sure SM58 in a tiny venue sounds. And their instruments? They're not even plugged in. I'm pretty sure under all that 2010s camera mic obliteration, what you're hearing are MIDI guitars, but their drummer is actually playing, and fucking, this is what is breaking my brain. Their playing is accurate. Like, not perfectly accurate, but the riff to God Knows was one of the first things I learned on guitar in my teens. I know what it looks like, and that's the gist of it. Which means, for the sake of authenticity, the women in these costumes had to learn the gist of how to play God Knows in order to go up on stage, hold these instruments that aren't even plugged in, and pantomime along to MIDI arrangements. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Scope. Scope. Neo Robotics website says they appeared on TV once, but other than that, this is a project that has not blown up. And I get the feeling blowing up isn't really one of the priorities here. I mean, if something like this gains popularity, it's because of the novelty factor, unless you're one in a million. And there is plainly no room for novelty within Neo Robotics' highly particular grand design. I can just imagine the alternate universe where a bunch of human interest article clickbait mills turned neurobotics into a wacky Japan oddity the online masses vaguely remember alongside Cell 9000 marrying his Nintendo DS wife Nene Onigasaki and the guy who left his copy of Umihara Kawase running for 20 years, but neurobotics, neurobotics is more than that. Over on their YouTube channel, you can find a series of monthly uploads used to share updates and promote the band, which in itself you could say feels pretty savvy and even ahead of its time, but the priority is, for the better, that it is so entertaining watching these robot girls lounge around. Sometimes they're doing more exciting stuff, to be fair, but again, I love a good juxtaposition, and this is where it's at. It's cute to me in the same way that Jiko-chan is. Watching the scope of the project expand over the years of uploads is pretty wild and pretty relatable. At the start, there's just the three of them, and then they start multiplying, and it's like, oh, they're assembling a fucking army. For true, there is no doubt in my mind that the guy manning this camera is experiencing more raw human bliss in this moment than the sum total of joy experienced by every person watching this video combined. The Neo Robotics YouTube stopped uploading around 2017, and the nature of the social media timeline means I'm missing about five years of Neo Robotics lore, but they're still trucking and introducing new members and independently releasing music entirely on CD. I bought one, but because new robotics is still an ongoing thing, I'm not gonna rip this one for a change. You can still get some of their CDs within a few clicks of their social media pages. I'm so accustomed to doing deep dives on topics that are firmly relics of a particular era or a nearly completely forgotten subculture therein, so to see multiple instances in one video of a torch being carried into modernity is 
oddly touching. It's like working in a morgue and one day one of the cadavers springs up and says, hey, sorry, I'm not supposed to be here actually. A connection is going to be made by a connection is going to be made by the two warm bodies in a room full of death, and as a result, Neurobotics and Jiko-chan are both up there with Heisei Pistol Show, Ramia Ryo, and Butt Attack Punisher Girl Gotamon in the hierarchy of favorite things I only found via this channel, and even then, sort of accidentally. Anyway, Hideaki Anno's live-action adaptation of Cutie Honey is the greatest movie ever made, and every single human should see it. It's perfect in every way. Right, David? Uh that's right. And you know who worked on it? Yutaka Izabuchi, the guy who designed Mighty Lady. All comes full circle. Good night, folks.